And in this video, I would like to discuss with you and give you a few ideas on how to apply professional performance engineering in the context of Formula Student competitions. Hello everyone, I'm Bruno. I'm the lead performance engineer at Optimum G. What is performance engineering in the context of Formula Student? I will define as once the design, the car design is finished and the car is built, what are you doing to make sure that you exploit all of the performance available and also that you use the knowledge acquired to improve the next year's car? This is something that I don't see many teams doing. I go to the competitions as a design judge and it's very rare to see occasions in which the team really made concrete decisions when testing the car on a setup change based on the data or to improve the next year's car also based on the learnings from the data. This is something that I would like to see more in Formula Student. Why? Because this is something that we do daily when we are at the track in professional motorsports. So there are many things that Formula Student teams can do actually even better the most professional racing teams, but performance engineering is not one of them. So with this, I hope to give you a few ideas so that you can start building your performance engineering team inside your formal student team. So let's start. What would be the pillars for the performance engineering that we teach at Optimum G? So we want you to learn performance engineering methodologies, not recipes, and using both a data-driven and vehicle dynamics-based approach. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we have three different pillars to define how we are gonna um, do our performance engineering. The first pillar could be experience, and this is actually what most people are using, both in professional motorsports and Formula student teams. But the second one that we really like to emphasize that makes a huge difference is vehicle dynamics knowledge so that you know what you are doing. You know why the car is behaving the way it is. You know why the, driving is driver, uh, the driver is driving the way it is. And by combining this, you can make uh, better decisions. And the last one that is our third pillar is data-driven approach. Data-driven means that we are going to be using or backing our decisions on the data. So it could be looking at log data, or it could be many other sources of information that we can get when we are testing the car or trying to validate the car in the shop. So with these three pillars, which is what I'm going to be showing you, showing you a few examples here, you can really make use of performance engineering to improve your car. So as I just said, it doesn't need to be logged data necessarily. Performance engineering is making sure that you can use all the available data that you can get from your car, from your environment, from your track and from your competition. So as you can see here, we have many different examples. We have log data, we have driver feedback, video, which we're gonna be discussing, track geometry, simulation results, many others, such as tire wear, tire temperatures, fuel consumption, weather results, ob observing your competitors, um, and looking at and analyzing your setup sheets. So it is important to know that once you have all that information, it doesn't mean that you're already doing performance engineering or that you can improve your car based on that. So as we can see here, if you invest a little bit of time or actually um, some time, you're gonna get the data, but the value is not very high. We can see that on the scale, the value is actually low by only having the data. What is the next step? The next step would be processing this data. So if you invest time in processing the data, we can see that the time is increased, but at the same time, we are adding a little bit more value, not a lot. The next step that I see rarely people doing this in formal shooting is visualizing. What is the best way or the right way to visualize your data? This is gonna add a little bit more value, but we can see that this curve is exponential. So if we invest even more time, you're gonna use these visualization techniques in order to draw conclusions. And this is what we need. So as you can see here, yes, you did invest more time, but the results that you got out of it are exponential. And what do I see usually when I go to formal student competitions? This is what I see. I see many teams getting data, logged data, or even tire temperatures. Not many of them processing the data or having a very streamlined way of processing this data and using this data. Just a few plotting interesting um, charts, time distance, um, scatter plots to try and understand the car or validate the design, and very, very few that can make use of all of this to make concrete decisions on a daily basis. And this is the goal of this presentation. So what would be a data-driven decision-making? Let's say that we have a lot of data, that we, we already explained all the different sources of the data, and this is raw data. We cannot do much with it. So they, if the engineer gets all of this raw data, how can he or she process the, this data to make decisions? So he's just going to be guessing, mm, it could be differential, 
We could be blaming the drivers, as we always do, uh, but we are not completely sure. We are just using experience to try and guess what is causing the balance or behavior issue we are seeing. But what would be a real data-driven decision-making process? It would be, we have the raw data that we collected from all different sources. We organize them. Do you guys remember? We process, then we visualize. And also very important, so now that we processed and visualized this data, we select what information we are going to use and what information we are not going to use. So the data never needs to be, to be perfect. We don't need perfect data, but there, it's important for you to understand when, when the data is not accurate to the point that you can make use of that to be making decisions. So this is also an important part of the process. Now, with the data processed, it's not, we are not guessing. We are looking at the data. So if we think that it could be differential behavior, we can look at the wheel speed difference between left and right and understand, did we change this? Did we not? Is the difference too high? Do we get enough locking of the differential? Or if we think that it's aerodynamics, what is the downforce distribution for different um, sections of the circuit? And so, for example, here, now that we have the information, we understood, okay, it is actually a problem with downforce distribution. So we are going to change one degree of the wing and we made a data-driven decision. So. Let's give just a few examples of how we can make other good data-driven decisions. The first one and the simplest one would be to analyze your driver. So what sensors do we need to analyze the driver? Actually, very few. We need speed sensor that usually is coming from wheel speeds. We need obviously steering, TPS or throttle position, and we need brake pressure. With these four channels, we can make a lot of analysis um, regarding your, our drivers. So those could be using the proper log data. We could be also using onboard video and making very good use of driver feedback as we're gonna discuss. When starting analyzing your drivers, the easiest way to proceed is by looking at speed traces. Why? Because we can identify where each driver is gaining or losing. So if you have two drivers to compare, this is gonna make your process very straightforward. So we start with the speed channel. So what we could be doing here is we could be visually inspecting. Okay, so one driver is gaining time here in the braking, another one is gaining back uh, this time in acceleration and so on. But this is not a very automated process. If you remember the plot that I showed um, a few minutes ago where we analyzed the time invested by how much value we get, we would be in early stages there because we are not automating, we are just barely visualizing the data that we have. What would be the most streamlined way to do this analysis to make sure that we are, you are indeed using it at the track? It is using the channel called variance. So the variance is already included in many uh, data analysis software, but in case it is not, you can even calculate it. So the variance is giving us how many seconds or how much time one driver is gaining compared to the other. So in this case, we have, if the value is positive, so the scale here would be, for example, half a second, one second here. So we see that the red driver is faster if this number is positive, or the red driver is slower, meaning that the driver in black is gaining time. So this is very straightforward because instead of trying to compare the area between these two traces, we're just looking, okay, driver in black is losing one second to driving red in this braking zone. And then it is gaining back on this straight line and so on. So when I'm analyzing your um, data from your formula student, you can understand, is the driver losing in this specific braking? Is he losing all the braking zones? Is he losing slaloms in fast sections, in um, slow sections? You can be analyzing with the variance. There is an even more straightforward and streamlined way of looking at this that not many people are using, which is variance gain. This is the derivative of the variance. So we can see here that the driver is losing, let's say one second, but we kind of have to look at this by the inclination of this curve, of this trace, the higher the inclination, the more time the driver is losing. However, if we calculate the derivative of this, meaning the variance gain, we have an instantaneous measurement of how much time the driver is losing in that specific section. So here we would be seeing that he's losing a lot in this section, in this section, and in this section, while he's gaining here and here. So you guys see that we went from a very slow and hard to quantify way of looking at this to a very streamlined and quick way of analyzing. And when you make your all your process fast, it is when you're gonna be starting to use this in real testing of your car and using it in real life. 
So here you have the equations in, in case you want to calculate it, which would be the variance between the two channels in terms of distance and the derivative of this channel. The next input that we said we were going to discuss is steering, because the steering can give us a lot of information about the driver. We have a video specifically on how driver inputs influence the balance of the car. So here I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how you could be using it. So again, here we are comparing two drivers. It's not necessarily, it's not necessary, but it makes our um, discussion a little bit easier. And what we can see here, we have first the speed trace on the top and the steering angle at the bottom. We can see that the red driver is many times steering a lot more than the driver in black. Why? This is an indication of understeer. The, driver is, the car is understeer and also the driver is steering more than needed. And what is interesting here is that the car is the same, the setup is the same. The only difference is really the driver. So the driver inputs, the, driving, the driver style and so on. What else can we see here? So it is important that we discuss with, you, with the driver, why is he doing this much? Or trying to understand why is he having so much more understeer and it's a lot more steering wheel angle compared to the other driver, to the reference driver. Another indication we can see here is this oversteer correction. So you can see for both drivers, they have some corrections here. So they are turning to one side, but they are make, applying corrections to the other side. So this is oversteer. Why that is? Is it the setup? Is the throttle application? And so on. And we also see oscillations, mainly for the driver in red, more so than the reference driver. So it is important to understand why your driver is doing this. So first we saw where each driver was losing time. And now we see why that is in terms of the steering or how does this reflect on the steering channel. Again, we have a whole video discussing this. The next example um, of how you can use simple sensors to make data-driven decisions is looking at throttle application. So on a quick example, again, we have our reference driver in black and our comparison driver in red. What can we see? The red driver is trying to apply the throttle a lot earlier and then we try to understand why that is. Why is the driver doing this? And it's interesting because if we look at the speed trace, he carried a lot less speed. So probably he carried less speed and he could he noticed that he could go back on the throttle earlier. Is this good or is this bad? You can go to back to the variance channel and analyze this whole section. Did he gain time by using this different maybe driving line or technique or is he losing time? And then you can explain to him that he maybe he should be carrying more speed and delaying the throttle application a little further like the driver in black. Why that could be better? Because as we can see here, he applied the throttle early but then he could never go back to full throttle and go, going back to full throttle is very important. So he needed to delay probably because this was causing understeer or oversteer on the car. And then he could only apply full throttle here um, a few meters later. So he's probably losing time by doing this. Um, the next driver input that we look at is brake application. So what we should be looking at applying the brakes. We could see here on this quick example that one of the drivers is applying more pressure, so the peak pressure is higher. And if we look at deceleration, it's going to be also a lot higher. In Formula Student, this is something that we see often. Many times, drivers are not exploiting the brakes at maximum capacities. So this is an interesting channel to be looking at. So the driver was able to apply a higher peak pressure. This means that he was able to brake 15 meters later. So it's also important to quantify this and to give this information to our driver. So it's not only brake later because the other driver is doing, is try to understand why one driver can brake later than the other and by how much. We can also see that the driver is trail braking a lot more. The, ref, the comparison driver is trail braking a lot more. This is also going to influence the balance of the car and you're going to have a full video on this subject. Another analysis that we mentioned Video analysis. There is a lot that can be done in Formula Student by using video. So just look at these examples. See if you can notice anything here. The first thing that we can notice is driving line. So for example, we can be analyzing not only the driving line, but how close to the cones the drivers are getting. So for example here, looking at this whole corner, maybe you could say that there could be a better driving line, for example. Um, here as well, you're going to see that the driver is a lot closer. You can compare the different driving line of your drivers. Another interesting thing is when you can um, overlay the data. So you'll see here some examples where we have the data here, we have the data here for the tires, speed, gear, um, throttle and brakes. This is not as efficient as looking at the raw data like we were doing, speed, throttle, um, steering and brakes. However, it could be a good way of communicating with your driver. He's more visual, he needs these visual references. So this could be uh, another strategy. So in order to synchronize the data with the video, you could be doing this using a dedicated system such as VBOX, AIM, MOTEC and so on. 
or you could do manual syncing. There are a few pieces of software in which you can import the video, the data and synchronize and you can see a few examples here. Next is, okay, so we went to the track, we have the data, we have the video, we also need to get driver feedback. Even during the test in between runs, we need to get the driver feedback. Are you doing this? And how are you doing this? So I'm gonna show you here a simple example of a run slash feedback sheet could look like. So here we can get um, the lap times in this column. We are gonna get feedback. So the driver can give us feedback, for example, in this corner or this corner or this corner. And we can take notes here. This makes it very visual even for the driver, for the engineer. We could be putting uh, turn numbers here and then taking notes separately. We can add a few comments about the car and what setup changes we made besides information on the track and on the tire. What we're focusing here is on driver feedback. So what are we expecting from our driver? Are you asking the right questions and are your drivers giving you the correct information that you need? So typically the driver is going to be saying understeer or oversteer. But the question is, where is the car understeer or oversteer? So is it low speed or high speed? Is it entry, apex or exit of the corner? Is it in steady state or transient? These are very important questions because each of these questions here or depending where the car is understeer or oversteer, the setup change you're gonna make is gonna be very different. So here we have a few examples. Let's say that we are having issues with balance in low speed. So mid corner, low speed. What changes are you gonna make? Are you gonna make a um, aerodynamics change, wing angle change? Probably not. And there are many other changes that you would not make in this situation. Some examples that would be very influential. End roll bar and springs to change the roll stiffness distribution. If you remember, we said that vehicle dynamics is under, uh, understanding is very important because then we can quantify these changes. Differential would be in, um, influential, Ackermann or toe, tire pressure, camber, and so on. However, if it's balanced in high speed, it could be wing, it could be right height, and other options. Or if it is in response, so corner entry or transient maneuvers that you need car response, you are going to be using a different set of setup changes. In this case, some ideas are toe, damping, torque vectoring, and so on. This is why it's so important for you to get the information from your driver of where in the lap or where even where in the corner he's having understeer or oversteer issues. Here I have a, uh, an example from Professional Motorsports, and it would be interesting if you can find a, an example with your own onboard or data. So here, the driver is having balance issues, but we need to understand where, because this changes what we want to do with the car. So as we can see, oversteer. On a first look, it could look at the apex, but let's look at it again. When the driver starts to steer, he gets oversteer and needs to apply a correction. So this is not apex oversteer. This is um, steering application, corner entry, or change of direction oversteer. So this is it is important. It's typical to do this in motorsports to get where understeer and oversteer is happening. But in Formula Student, it is something that many of the teams still need to focus on understanding to make the right setup calls, setup change calls. Okay, so we finished driver analysis. You guys saw how much we can do with very few sensors. The next is car analysis. So for car analysis, we need obviously more sensors. So some more specific sensors that could be useful could be damper pots, temperatures, tire, brakes, and so on, load cells in different components, especially on the suspension that you can get wheel loads and downforce, and, and so on. So we could be looking again at log data, we could be looking at driver feedback, we could be looking at KPIs and metrics that we're gonna be discussing in a little bit, or you can be looking also making use of simulation and comparing with your real data. So let's give a, just a few simple examples that you could be doing. The first one, we are gonna quantify how effective the brake system is. So here we are plotting on the y-axis front pressure, front brake pressure versus rear brake pressure. You can see that in this case, we for a given rear pressure, we were expecting a fixed and constant front pressure, but it's not the case. We can see that for one rear pressure, we can have many different front pressures, even though the driver input is only one and the brake bias is theoretically constant. What is happening here is that our system has hysteresis. So we can see that with this high hysteresis that could be coming from system compliance, any part of the brake system or pedal assembly or free play, 
It could be that your fluid is not good enough or went bad with temperature and so on. This causes compliance and hysteresis on the system and this gives a very imprecise or you lack precision under braking because your brake bias is varying because of this fact. Um, on a second example, let's say that the team improved the whole brake system, fluid, bleeding procedure, pedal assembly, you have a lot less hysteresis, which is the second case. In this case, the driver can be a lot more confident on the brakes because he's gonna have more consistent brake bias, which is gonna cause less variation under braking of is the front axle locking, is the rear axle locking, and so on. So in this case, it is interesting because yes, here we are visualizing, but we can go even one step further. We can quantify this by fitting a trend line, as we can see here getting the equation of this trend line and then computing the R squared. The R squared component of this equation is going to tell us or it's going to quantify how much hysteresis we have and we can compare it year by year. And I'm going to show an even more effective way of looking at this. The next example would be suspension performance. So suspension performance is usually analyzed using damper pots. So damper pots can be used to calculate wheel displacement, which we're basically converting from damper displacement to suspension displacement. And with this, we can calculate row and pitch, which can validate so many aspects of your suspension design. Then we have bump stop engagement in case you are using it, damping characteristics, suspension stiffness, ride height estimates if laser sensors are not available, and many other things that you could be doing with these sensors. So one simple example would be using the damper potentiometers to calculate car roll. And then with the roll, you can calculate the roll gradient, which you can use both to quantify setup changes, but also to validate your design. What was the target roll gradient you had in your design? What is the real roll gradient you have on your car? And try to understand why you have such a difference. So here we have row angle on the y-axis, we have lateral acceleration on the x-axis, so as you increase lateral acceleration, your car is rolling more. If you fit trend lines to these curves, you're gonna get the equation of these linear curves. The first coefficient is gonna be showing you or giving you the row gradient. So in this case, for the front suspension in red, we have 0.1 degrees per G for a professional motorsports cars, car. And on, in blue, we have the rear row gradient of 0.4 degrees of row per G of flat acceleration. So this is a very, again, streamlined way of validating your car design. Another interesting aspect of, of linear potentiometers is that you can even estimate the load on your suspension. So we have two options to quantify load on the suspension. We can be installing load cells on the push or, push or pull rods. Or um, another option would be to have a linear potentiometer installed on, in parallel with your damper. And if you have the displacement of the damper and you know the spring stiffness, you can estimate how much force is going through your coilover assembly. With this, you can convert to force on the wheel using the motion ratio. And now you have the force on the wheel. This is an approximation. It doesn't take into account geometric weight transfer, for example, but it is a good approximation for many analysis. So here, I would like to show you that actually the results comparing a load cell versus the calculated load from the damper potentiometers is actually similar. So you can see here that in black, we have the load directly measured with a strain gauge or load cell and the color we have in color we have the calculated load using linear potentiometers and actually they are quite similar um, for most of the lab so at least to quantify some aspects of your car this can be very useful for example you could be using it to quantify the downforce of the car Usually you want to quantify the downforce in straight line at the end of the straight so that you don't have much weight transfer, but you can be using it to understand what is my downforce coefficient, what is my downforce distribution, and when I make setup changes, what is happening. All of this is actually quite complicated to be looking on this raw data. This is why we go back to one of the first plots we discussed, where if you invest more time, you convert from processing the data, which is what we're doing here, to the proper way of visualizing it and then making decisions um, based on it. So let's quickly speak about key performance indicators or KPIs. Here we can see a lot of raw data from our damper pots. What can we do with this data? Not much. But, um, so when we are looking at time distance plots, they're not ideal for analyzing multiple laps. When we want to analyze multiple laps and simplify all of our analysis, we should be using KPIs, in which we're gonna be converting all of this into metrics, more easily understandable. So KPIs, the goal is to combine several logged channels and to get a single output relevant uh, to the characteristic you are trying to quantify from the car. So for example, let's combine many different channels, 
process this information and come to a single value, which is one KPI. With this, we could be trying to characterize driver aggression, driving style, vehicle balance, different systems characteristics. So I already said that we can do this with brakes, with aerodynamics, and also with reliability of your prototype. So on, on the one hand, we have log data inspection that we should be using, especially to compare drivers or to compare specific laps, for example, autocross laps. You should be using this type of log data inspection as we already gave a few examples. However, when we are trying to look at the progression or setup changes along a session, uh, a testing session and so on, and more complicated um, effects such as downforce distribution, we should be counting more on KPIs. So let's look at a few examples. The simplest KPI you can have is lap time. Why? Because lap time you are getting a single value per lap. And we can see here that for different sessions and different drivers, we can see the lap times, how the lap times are getting better as the tires get, get warmer and also how it's getting worse. And then we can quickly compare different drivers' performance and even quantify consistency. The next example would be another very simple KPI. When you're looking at logged data, instead of trying to understand which driver is braking harder than the other, we can create a KPI that is gonna show us for each of the laps, as we can see here, each of these dots is a different lap for different drivers, what is the maximum deceleration that they can achieve? How do we do this? We just need to get the longitudinal acceleration process it by looking at the minimum value of a lap, because the harder you're braking, the lower your deceleration is. And then we come up with a KPI, and then we can plot this over sessions for different setups or even for different drivers in a test session. Another example, very simple, is the steering integral. To understand how your drivers are driving differently and using the steering differently, this is one of the ways of quantifying it. So here we can see that one driver, if we integrate the steering over a lap, the more steering the driver is use, using, typically it indicates more understeer for that driver. So we can see here the driver in green is having a lot more understeer compared to the driver in red. Then we can go back to our log data and try to understand why. This is how we better process that brake system example. So in that case, we need to be looking at the plot for a single lap and then comparing different cars, for example, one year versus the next year. But we can create KPIs out of that, so we don't depend on the plot anymore or on the trend line. We're simply looking at a specific value per lap. So in this case, we're looking at front brake pressure, rear brake pressure, and coming up with the R squared. So you need to find a way to, a way to automate the calculation of the R squared. With this, look how interesting, we can calculate the hysteresis and the more negative, the higher the hysteresis is, indicating that the brake system is becoming less effective for different test sessions. So you can even understand from the first test until the competition, what happened with your brake hysteresis. Did it get better because we were bleeding the brakes, replacing fluids, uh, fluids often, or was it getting worse and you never improved it? And then the braking, uh, braking performance was only getting worse. It is also interesting because if you calculate this in a given year, you can recalculate this the year after, show that you minimized compliance on your system and even bring these ideas to design presentations. Because you are validating your project, you, are you could be defining goals in decreasing this, finding ways of decreasing this, and even reducing mass at the same time and quantifying the changes that you made. So another example on how to use data-driven analysis and performance engineering to improve next year's car. And another example is the downforce distribution one. We spoke that you can be using even damper pots to estimate your downforce distribution at the end of the straights, but it's quite hard to be looking at the full data to, to get that number. Why don't you create a KPI in which you use wheel loads in specific conditions, for example, end of the straight, low longitudinal acceleration, to come up with this KPI? And this is another interesting part. Here, in this specific test, so we can see a few laps here, a few laps here, a few laps here. So we have four outings. We are not simply making setup changes, we're quantifying these changes. So we make the first change, we change two degrees of the rear wing, and we quantify how much downforce was changed from this change. So here we can see that we go from 52% to 50%. So two degrees of the wing meant 2% of downforce distribution. We went for another two degrees of change. And again, we see um, something close to 2%, more, more like 1.5% in this change. And then we go back to baseline in this test just to make sure that we have a consistent and re um, reliable system. So this is very interesting because now we know how much we're changing by making a setup change. And also we can again validate our design. Does this match 
what your CFD or wind tunnel measurements are telling you. Is the aero map that you have in your simulation, CFD or wind tunnel, matching what you see on track? And you can do this very, not easily, but in a very straightforward way by making use of KPIs. So again, what did we see here in this presentation? Once the car is designed and built, how we can make sure that, number one, we exploit all of the performance available. So we saw how we can optimize drivers, how we can quantify setup changes. And second thing, how you can use the knowledge to improve next year cars. We also had lots of examples. What is the secret here? It's very easy telling you all of this. It's actually relatively easy for you to apply many of this. However, you are only gonna start really using it on a daily basis once you automate your tools. So if you're downloading the data, you don't have the data cropped lap by lap. Um, you cannot quickly compare different drivers. If everything is manual, you are never gonna do this because it's gonna take you a few hours to do one of the analysis that I showed you here and you don't have the time during the test. However, if you aut automate and streamline your, your process, you download the data, the data is either already cropped lap by lap or you have a trigger and you have a script that can quickly crop that. Your logs are identified with specific drivers. Many comments explaining what was changed, what day that was very organized in, in a way that you can make quick analysis. This is the only way that you're going to use it. And in terms of KPIs, you also have to automate. You have to have um, scripts or data analysis software that allows you to quickly convert the log data to a table. And then from this table, you can plot all these charts. So automation is the secret. Obviously, first, you are focused on car reliability, making sure your cars are used to, your drivers are used to the car. But the next steps for the teams who are already there is to start using more performance engineering. I, I would love to see uh, more of this performance engineering being used in the Formula Studio context. So a very good resource for you to learn more about everything that was discussed here is our data-driven performance engineering seminar. In this seminar, we are going to expand on top of what was discussed here with hundreds of practical and real examples. And it's going to give you a lot of ideas on how to analyze the data, but also how to automate the process to make sure that you are using performance engineering with your Formula student car. Other seminar that is also very related to this subject is our Applied Vehicle Dynamics Seminar. So this seminar gives you all the foundation you need to make data-driven and vehicle di dynamics-backed um, decisions. So you're gonna learn how to design a car, how to understand the car is behaving, and how to optimize the car. So for both seminars, you find the calendar in, the, the link for the calendar in the description. We have dates all around the world, um, year long. And also, if you have any questions about the seminars, feel free to send us an email at seminars at optimumg.com. And also, OptimumG is always look, looking to hire great people. And we have internship positions open. So we have positions open in vehicle model development and simulation. So really developing vehicle dynamics models and exploiting them for car design or performance engineering. We have software development in two different areas, which are vehicle dynamics simulation or motorsports tools. And we also have data analysis and performance engineering um, internship positions. If you think that you can impress us with your work, with your progress, with your motivation, please reach out at jobs at optimumg.com. Don't forget to not only send your CV, but also examples of projects we you have developed. So screenshots, examples that you can share with us, we would be looking forward to, hear, uh, to hearing from you. I hope it is useful. I hope that you guys can start implementing some of these techniques in your Formula student teams. And I'll see you guys in the next one.